I can break software protections. I can penetrate computer systems. I can pick locks. This can be quite lucrative. I run a company, Cambridge Cyber, that offers, among other things, effective and discreet penetration testing services. A client comes to us with their newest prototype and asks us to check if it's secure before putting it on the market. We find security vulnerabilities in it, we show them how to fix them, and they're very happy to pay our substantial fee because it is only a small fraction of the losses they would have incurred if they had released an insecure product. How cool is that? I will even teach you how to do it. Besides running that company, I'm a professor of security and privacy at Cambridge, where I teach a hands-on undergraduate course on cybersecurity. And if you're willing to put in the work, I'll let you access my university lectures at no charge. And also, I'm the one of the original founders of the C2C International Capture the Flag competition for university students that since 2015 has been raising a new generation of cyber defenders. With this background, you will understand that I am all in favor of cultivating the uncommon superpower of discovering security vulnerabilities. Some simple-minded people are worried that I, a university professor, teach my students how to break into systems. But it's essential for the good guys to acquire this skill if we don't want to be outsmarted by the bad guys. It requires a special kind of intelligence coupled with playful deviousness and what used to be called the hacker spirit, where hacker does not mean what most people understand it to mean nowadays, but we won't go into terminology today. So not everyone will be up for learning this skill and not everyone will be able to become good at it. But it's quite rewarding when you do. Now, while I encourage my brightest students to become good at finding vulnerabilities, today's video is about doing so responsibly and professionally, because I have also come across very clever but misguided young people who did so quite irresponsibly and who could have easily got into rather serious trouble later. The most worrying thing to me is that when we took them aside to have a little word with them, they didn't seem to get it. They didn't think they had done anything wrong. And that, more than what they actually did, is the core of the problem, and that's what I want to address today. Let me start by repeating once more, as explicitly as I can, that I believe it's a good thing when a good guy finds a vulnerability and reports it to the owner of the system, thereby giving them a chance to fix it. Of course, the owner will be a bit embarrassed, because it makes them look careless, and a bit annoyed, because fixing will take extra work and expense and time, and they'd rather just do their normal stuff. But they should also be very grateful, because if the good guy had not reported the flaw, then a bad guy might have found it first and exploited it, causing actual damage, and then the owner would have been much more embarrassed and would have incurred a much greater loss and would have had to spend a lot more in remediation. So, in those cases where I am the one setting the policy, which I have been, I want to encourage such disclosure. I definitely don't want to disincentivize and scare off the good guys and make them prefer to keep their clever discovery to themselves, because they will make these discoveries at some point in some instances. But I do want to encourage responsible disclosure. If the finder of the vulnerability simply publishes it widely to get credit for his clever find, he's encouraging hordes of bad guys to go out and exploit it, causing widespread damage. That is not a good idea, obviously. The responsible approach instead is to disclose the vulnerability to the owner of the system and to whoever else is in a position to remedy the flaw, such as manufacturer of the software, and to give them a reasonable time window to fix it in before going public with it. Now, what I just said is how to behave responsibly after having discovered a vulnerability. But there is another equally important issue, which is how to behave responsibly while discovering the vulnerability in the first place. Here in the UK, and similarly in other jurisdictions, but let me be specific so I can cite chapter and verse, unauthorized access to a computer system constitutes an offence. Section 1 of the Computer Misuse Act 1990 says, in essence, that a person is guilty of an offence if he tries to access data on any computer where the access is unauthorized and he knew that it was unauthorized. If you are a clever person with the ingenious and playfully mischievous hacker spirit that we were talking about earlier, and you find, perhaps by accident, that you can get into parts of a system that you were not supposed to, then it would be natural to want to investigate further to confirm whether there is in fact an exploitable vulnerability that you might wish to report and perhaps write up and get credit for an CVE and maybe even earn a bug bounty and so on and so forth. But once you get a hunch that there might be a vulnerability in there, if you carry out this investigation, beneficial though it might be in theory, you may be accessing data that you were not authorized to access, in which case you are already committing an offense under the Computer Misuse Act. And this is the part that some of you might fail to grasp. And this is the core message I want to get across today. It doesn't matter that the system was so poorly protected that you could get in without much effort. 
it doesn't matter that you are going to report the vulnerability later and that you are not trying to steal anything or cause any damage. In the eyes of the law, the fact that you are accessing with intent data that you knew you were not authorized to access already makes you guilty of an offense. And consider yourself lucky if the owner of the system does not take you to court over it, but they could. You have already violated the law. Let's look at physical examples to make this clear. Cambridge is a bicycle city. Many bicycles are secured with locks that a moderately competent person can open pretty quickly. If you are able to open a bike lock in under a minute with modest effort, does it mean that the bike is yours for the taking? Clearly not. Imagine further that the bike is parked on the bike rack without even a lock, as some are. Does that mean the bike is yours for the taking? No. Obviously, you would still be committing an offense of bike theft if you took the bike even though the anti-theft protection was inadequate or even inexistent. So, the part of the law that refers to the access being unauthorized is not in any way linked to the strength of the mechanism that attempts to restrict access. A few people don't seem to get this, but it's very important. It's the distinction that we have in the English language between the verbs can and may. Can I eat this? Well, of course you can. You have the technical ability to eat this. Just put it in your mouth, chew and swallow. But, may I eat this? Now, that's another story. No, you may not eat this, even though you can reach and grab it, because it is meant for the guests who are due to come later. Just because you can do something does not mean you may do it. Can is do you have the ability to do it, whereas may is do you have the permission to do it. And it's very important to keep the two separate. If I forget to lock my front door when I go out, can you go in and steal all my stuff? Yes, obviously you can. It's going to be very easy. The door is unlocked. But do you have permission to do so? Do you really think that the fact that I forgot to lock my front door means I gave you permission to steal all my stuff? If you are into lock sport, you're hopefully aware of the two golden rules. Only pick a lock if you have the consent of the owner. Why? Because otherwise it's an unauthorized access and you are committing an offense. And never pick a lock, rule number two, that you rely on or that is in use. Why? because the lockpicking operation may unintentionally disturb the operation of the lock and may cause it to fail. For example, if your lockpick breaks inside the keyway and then you're stuck with a front door that you can't close or, or a front door you can't open, neither of which is a desirable state of affairs. And there's a direct parallel, which I hope is obvious by now, between the two golden rules of Locksport and what you should do when looking for computer vulnerabilities. If you suspect that the program has a security flaw, and you probe for it on a test system that you set up for that purpose, on a computer that is disconnected from the net. That's all fine and dandy. That's like going out and buying a lock, putting it in a vice, and trying to pick it in your own home. You can do whatever you like. And then, if you confirm a vulnerability, you may report it responsibly, and you may get some credit for it, sometimes perhaps even a bounty, as we were saying. On the other hand, if you suspect that the live system, a live computer system, has a security flaw, and you start probing it, first of all, you're committing an offense. And second, you may unintentionally cause it to fail, which will make you really unpopular, even if in your mind you only had good intentions and you only wanted to make the system more secure. When my company takes on a penetration testing job, we first have the client ask us in writing to attempt to penetrate their system within clearly defined boundaries and time period. We then attempt to penetrate, but we have a written request from the asset owner that we were asked to do so. Clearly, this is legitimate. It's 100% authorized access, even if the access takes place through devious means, because the authorization is the engagement letter from our client. But if a would-be pen tester were to look at the website of his own initiative and find the vulnerability and build a proof of concept exploit, and then approach the website operator saying, would you like to pay me this amount to show you that you have a vulnerability and to, and to have me tell you how to fix it, then how do you feel about that? Well, arguably, for some people, that's still a positive thing to do, as opposed to, for example, you know, silently exploiting the vulnerability or selling it to the Russian mafia. Well, but it would not be proper. It would not be legitimate. It would, in fact, border on extortion. And the step where the guy access the system and build the proof of concept exploit before asking for permission from the website operator would already be a violation of the Computer Misuse Act, and therefore an offense. So, by all means, learn how to find vulnerabilities and how to break into computer systems, because this is a required skill for us good guys who are smart bad guys. But act responsibly, because these techniques are very powerful. The attack techniques I teach in my course are the same that are used in cyber weapons aimed at critical infrastructure. 
So you must act professionally. You must understand the rules of engagement. And you must stay legal at all times. Be aware of the relevant legislation in your jurisdiction. And as with the golden rules of lock sport, never attack a system without the authorization of its owner and never attack a system that is in use or is being relied on. And this makes the difference between the professional pen tester walking away from the engagement with a nice cash reward and the amateur pen tester walking away with his wrists in handcuffs. Say handcuff key if you made it to here. Click thumbs up if you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video.